named Robert M. Mitchell, Jr., 93 years old, live in Trustville, Alabama. I was born in Sheffield, Alabama, on November the 24th, 1921. All right. Well, I'd gone to, <coughs> wanted in the Air, air Corps, and uh, I'd me and one of my buddies there, we had, uh, had gone to get inducted in. We got back, found out we'd been drafted, and we contacted the draft board, and they said they had a quarter they had to send. So anyhow, I took my papers and everything. I went where I wanted to go through the draft. So. I was with the 384th uh, Bomb Group, 544th Squadron, and my position on B-17 was flying the ball turret. One reason I was in the ball turret, they had a critical shortage of them when I got to the 384th Bomb Group, and uh, I don't know where it was. Patriotism or stupidity, but I volunteered to fly that thing, and I wound up flying all my missions there instead of flying the top turret where I'd been trained to, I was flying the ball turret. The ball turret is underneath the airplane, <coughs> and it uh, protects the airplane from underneath. Uh, in all positions, anything coming up underneath it. And sometimes that might not be as many as four, five ball turrets on one ME-109. That didn't make any difference, but we didn't care who got the credit for it, just so we shot him down. Oh, uh, well, I was in 384th Bomb Group, and it was stationed. Uh, at Grafton Underwood, England. And that was a little town about 90 degrees, I mean about 90 miles north of London. I flew in a B-17 Flying Fortress, 38 combat mission. One in particular, August the 4th, about four o'clock in the afternoon, uh, we'd lost a propeller that was going across the channel and we could not drop our bombs there because of the shipping underneath everything in the channel. So we headed back to England, had a load of bombs on and we had a engine to go out on us. Lost the oil pressure in that and we lost the propeller. The propeller came over and instead of cutting the nose off like they usually do, well, it had flipped under and punctured the gas tank in the wing there and the exhaust had set the thing on fire so uh, we landed it on a old strip there that had been used as a decoy for the, get the loof off to come over and strafe it at night. And they would fly into uh, their doom at the end of what they thought was a runway. But anyhow, uh, we made it back on that thing and, uh, uh, Everybody got out, of course it was on fire. Bombs exploded there and uh, the only injury we had was a top turret gunner had had a, uh, he hit the propeller when he came out and cut down into the muscle of it. Uh, I think it was his right arm. He was the only injury that we had there. 
But we all got out of that. The airplane exploded and there wasn't anything left of it. We had this, it was a funny thing. We landed there and uh, this Englishman came down in a Jeep and I say, you can't land there. This is not an aerodrome. This is not an aerodrome. I told him, said, this thing's full of bombs there. So he jumped in the ditch with us, and the Jeep he was driving, the next thing he knew, that thing was blown all to pieces there. So uh, when they part left in the airplane or anything, all of them there were. Pretty tough there. Yeah. We saw a lot of B 17 shot down as well as ME 109s and FW 190s. Yeah, the pilot was Frank Aldred, co pilot was Bill Reed, navigator was Tim O'Sullivan, bombardier was Don Ward. Top turret gunner was Ray Noble. Radio operator was Eldon Drury. Tail gunner was Virgil Hunt. And the waist gunner was Carl Redke. And nose gunner Togolier was Nicholas Leshack and I, Robert Mitchell, flew the ball turret. Everybody's real proud of the leather jackets. Every mission we flew, we'd paint a bomb on the back of our jacket there and we'd put the name of our crew on the back of our jacket there. And the name of our crew was <clears throat> Little Joe. And where we got the name, Mary, everybody and everything, somehow or another, had a four connected with it. We had 384th Bomb Group, 544th Squadron, and every man had one or more fours in his serial number or something. And in the dice game, Little Joe was four when you roll in the dice, and so we just named our crew Little Joe there, and we painted a pair of dice on the nose of the plane, and we were given a brand new B-17, and we got it all painted and everything, and the nose painted, and another crew was flying it. Next day, we went out in mid-air collision, and we lost our airplane to another crew there. So we didn't get to sport our little Joe too much. <laughs> Got a bachelor's degree at what is now the uh, University of North Alabama at Florence. And then I got my master's at Vanderbilt and I was in uh, Nashville, Tennessee. I was on that World War II GI Bill, and we could take anything we wanted to. And I took all my uh, electives and everything with mathematics and science, and I took a good bit. I just took things I wanted. I took human development, one of the things there, psychology, and I took, we could take whatever we wanted to. And, uh, and I took advantage of it, and I just took what I wanted. I was just glad to get back. And my wife had been real patient there, and uh, I could say we had a pretty much choice what of World War II there. And uh, First thing I did, I'd gone through the National Training School for uh, Boy Scout executives. I'd worked with Boy Scouts and been an Eagle Scout myself and uh, worked with Boy Scouts <clears throat> there for a good way. Then uh, I took a 
correspondence course, civil engineering, and I worked as an engineer from then on. I retired from the engineering department of the Utna Casualty Company. My wife's name is, was Joyce Willett, W-I-L-L-E-T-T-E, Low, L-O-W-E. That was her maiden name. We've been married now 73 years. Two sons and a daughter living, and we have lost our first little daughter. She didn't live but a day, but we have had four children, two boys and two girls. Well, you just had to be alert at all times there, and, and I mean, your life depended on it. Not only my life, I had, but nine more. We were, Cruz was more or less like brothers there. We looked after each other, you know, and so forth, and uh, uh, they were close-knit. And we just, I don't know, more of a family type, I guess, feeling there among your crew members. Well, we had hit drop bombs on oil refineries, and we dropped bombs on marshaling yards for railroads. We had uh, strafe trains and drop bombs on freight trains, and we drop bombs on uh, well, industrial plants, and you know, we had all kinds of targets there. We dropped bombs on. The ball turret was considered the most dangerous there because there was not room down there for you to have your parachute on. We had a harness on, and our procedure was the radio operator of the waste gunner one would hand us a chest. We had a uh, uh, harness that we wore that we could snap up a parachute on and the procedure was that they would hand you the parachute out through a camera well underneath the uh, airplane between the bomb bays and the ball turret and you'd kick yourself out and then snap your parachute on after you're out of the plane. And I know when we were going through the procedure there, you know, somebody had asked the tack officer, said, we're not going to practice this all. And he said, no, it ain't supposed to be perfect the first time anyhow, so why practice? <laughs> well, we had a harness there, and the parachute was a chest chute. It snap on the, over your chest and then bail out and use a, uh, like bail out and use a parachute after you wanted to be careful there and they didn't open it too soon there because uh, you had lack of oxygen and you could freeze to death. Some of the free air temperature where we were was 50 and 60 degrees below zero and I had a friend there that, uh, well, he wasn't a real close friend. He was, you know, everybody's as close friends as you get, let's call something. But anyhow, he had uh, pulled his glove off. We had some solid silk gloves that we would put on, and we had electric gloves that we'd put on over there and plug it into an electric jacket we had. And, uh, uh, this fella had had to work on his guns or something. I forget what it was, but then uh, his fingers froze there all of a sudden, and he broke the three of them off right across there, and then the tip of the one, other one. He just on one hand, he just broke his fingers off. They froze and broke like icicles. Typical mission there, we would uh, 
sometimes six to eight hours. We'd wake up sometime three o'clock in the morning, go to briefing and everything, and it all depends. And then we had, sometimes we flew two missions a day. We'd go and, and drop bombs on a target in France and then come back and bomb up and go again that afternoon. Not too many of those, but we did do uh, two in a day's time, several times. We had there that once you left that airplane, your duty, if you want to call it that, was to evade and get back. And they told us that you are your own, on your own. If some two-star general gives you an order, you can tell him to kiss your butt there. You own your own. <laughs> he said, I wouldn't advise it, but <laughs> technically you could do it. That's <laughs> what the tech officer said. He got a little chuckle out of it. But we had real good maintenance there. Our, our ground crews there, they had put their heart in the work there to make sure we had a safe airplane that we could. I got over there and got finished my missions and I just would, uh, got it all done in what we call a Hershey bar, you know, for every three, and I was just over there three months. Most of us back then, we just uh, felt like this was our country there and we felt honored to have fought for it. I did. Then uh, I don't know, one of my aunts had done some research on our family history there and our uh, ancestry went, there's been Somebody in every major war from a Revolutionary War through. Somebody in our family there. And uh, that's on my daddy's side and on my mother's side. Well, the same thing. And she was a Stuart and somehow or another, we were kin to Jeb Stuart, I don't know. But <laughs> Before I went into the service, my daddy, being a World War I veteran, said he needed to have a little father-son talk, and he said that uh, I was going into the service, and he said he wanted me to wear that uniform with pride, said it had been worn that away ever since the Revolutionary War, and we had ancestors that fought for the Yankees as well as the Southerners, and so uh, we've, but he said we've always worn that uniform with pride there, and I want you to do the same thing, and said, and it's hard to say, but he said, I want you to come home one of two ways, either with the, honor, with the honorable discharge in your pocket, or with a flag draped over your casket. So it's hard to say that, but that's the way we feel about it. And I agree the same thing. Both my sons have served in the military. A son-in-law, which is just like a son. <laughs> and uh, we have the utmost respect for the United States military. Army, Navy, Marines. They served in all of it, Air Force, 